Hey, everybody, this is TJR. And this is Robert Kinsler. And we are back after a very long hiatus with our top 100 songs of all time feature. And I guess we should maybe say a little something about this since it's been a little while. It has. How long has it been since we did one of these? Well, it, was it was before the lockdowns. It was before pre-pandemic. Yeah. And we didn't know the lockdowns were going to happen. And then they did happen. And the whole series just kind of got put on hold. And so we're back now. We're doing this virtually still, even though we're both fully vaccinated. And uh, the pandemic here in Southern California appears like we're coming to the end at this yeah. point. We'll Let's see what happens. So, right? Yeah, I know there's the Delta variant out there and stuff, but we'll, California seems to be doing okay. We'll just see what happens. But um, at any rate, for those of you who may be here for the first time, and for those of you who uh, maybe want a little refresher, the top 100 songs is something that we started uh, where each week we name off five songs in our top 100. And we don't know the other individuals' five songs that they're going to talk about. I don't know yours. You don't know mine. But the main thing about this that we should say is that this top 100 is a personal top 100. Oftentimes, when you see these, you know, top 100 songs, top 50 songs, top 100 albums, it's, it's a lot of emphasis is put on, say, historical significance you know, um, the legacy of the song or the album. Whereas here, none of that matters. This is our personal top 100 songs. Everything else flies out the window and we go at this with a very stream of consciousness approach. Whatever the first song is that comes into your head when you think of your top 100 songs, that's your number one. Whatever the second song you think of that pops into your head when you think of your top 100 songs, that's your number two. And so we started doing this where we said, okay, five at a time, 10 songs per video. And we'll each do our, we did our top five, one through five, then we did six through 10 and so on and so forth. And we happened to leave off right at the halfway mark with 50. And or rather today is 51. And we left off with 50, we're at the halfway mark. And so um, we're gonna pick up where we left off now. And we're each gonna divulge our number 51 uh, through 55. Yeah. yeah. And as I recall, I always had trouble keeping track of the numbers when we did it. I know, we, we'd say, oh, we're 50, 54. No, we're like today, we're 51 through 55. 55. I was always getting it wrong. And you were always having to correct me. So I hope- TJ, I don't think we were math whizzes. What do you think? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so 51 through 55 today. Um, who wants to go first? I'll go first if you want okay. me to. Go okay. right ahead. I want to hear. So uh, this is a band uh, that remarkably hadn't appeared on my list yet, even though they're one of my most longtime favorite bands, without a doubt. And that's Creedence Clearwater Revival, better known as CCR. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I mean, I love so many of the band songs, but I'm going with Have You Ever Seen the Rain? Okay. And, and just love that. And it's, it's amazing to think that CCR came, you know, came into the scene more than 50 years ago. And they just yeah. recently scored their first billboard topping hits. And it happened to be this one. This and, was one of their first hits. Yeah. I guess what happened is I, is I actually saw a press release not long ago that it, uh, it was on top of billboards, rock digital song sales chart number one but they had never i guess they had had a number of hits that scored strongly but they never happened to reach number one on any of the charts back in the day so it's wow. um and between 1968 and 1972 i mean you talk about a prolific band they released seven studio albums in yeah. what's that a four-year span and i mean so many of those songs and so many of those albums are are classics now but but I think everyone out there probably knows, have you ever seen the rain? Knows the song, just a great song, really resonates with me, you know, every time I hear it. I can remember that song from my childhood. 
And even though I wasn't into popular music at the time when I was a kid, I would hear my brothers and sisters, you know, from their radios, they would play in their rooms, I would hear songs. And of course, I would, um, you know, I, I remember as a kid walking through swap meets and everybody had radio, transistor radios blasting at these things. Everybody who was selling had transistor radios blasting. Oftentimes they were on the same station. So as you walked around, I'd be hearing all these top 40 hits as a kid uh, in the late sixties as a little kid uh, looking for comic books to buy at, at, uh, at swap meets and things like that. Uh, that's what I was doing. But yeah, that's one of those songs I remember from my childhood. I would hear it everywhere. And um, CCR is one of those bands that is, I've, I need to put them on my list because I'm familiar with all the hits, mm -hmm. but I've never really explored the albums. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just one of those things. You know, there's so many great bands out there. Uh, there are great movies I've never seen that are on my list that just because of only so much time in the day. And exactly. they're one of those bands I really need to dig a little deeper and explore their albums. And hearing you talk about them has kind of put that fresh in my head again my so. my father uh, you know just like my parents kind of got me into the Beatles and some of the other uh -huh. bands but my father loved CCR I think that that was maybe a little bit more up his alley mm -hmm. you know because he played banjo and came kind of from a blues uh -huh. Americana background so I think he really when they kind of came on the scene I think my dad really dug that a lot um, I wish now I could go back and talk to him about it more I've lost him since but he yeah. loved them I know you know, we had the vinyl albums and I, and I would play them and just, uh, you know, just love the band sound. You know, when you're a kid, you're soaking up everything. But yeah. yeah I, I kind of gravitated to them kind of like I did to the Doors and the Who and the Beatles, but yeah, that's, a, they have so many great songs. It's almost criminal to pick one and neglect another one. You know, no, you've got 50 more if you want to pick more. So that's right. I mean, yeah, there's still that. some room there. I know there's a lot of songs out there and you want to give everybody a shake, but yeah. But definitely, yeah. you've, got, you've got a little bit more time to get some more in there if you want. And yeah, exactly. I don't think I've picked a CCR song yet. And I probably should, because God, you know, God only knows there's a ton of great hits out there. Oh, um, okay. So my number 50. Um, 51. Oh, my 51. Thank you. 51. I'm already doing it. My We're failing 51. math already. All right. Here we go. My 51 is What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong which was released initially as a single. And I was inspired to pick this song by what was your number 50, I believe, which was Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Right. Because you said, you know, it's not really a rock or pop song, but it's still, you thought it was one of the, you know, one of the, it was one of your top 100 songs. And What a Wonderful World, not really a rock or pop song, I don't think, but just an amazing song all, all the same. And it's funny, as I, as I thought about this song and I was writing my list for this week, my five, I thought about that song and I tried to remember, when did I first hear it? And it feels to me like that song has been around for as long as I've been around, although it hasn't, it was released in 67. And, but it feels like I've always known it. When I look back, I can't remember when I first heard it. And I can't imagine a world without it where I didn't know about it. But the song was released in 67. So it's likely I may have heard it on the radio as a kid. You know, at that time when I was, you know, preteen, but becoming aware of these things. But surprisingly, uh, when the song was first released, it topped the UK charts. But here in the United States, it did very poorly. And reportedly that's because the president of ABC Records at that time where it was released on ABC Records, refused to promote it because he didn't like the song hmm. and that it wasn't until the late 80s when the song was featured on the good morning vietnam soundtrack that the song began to gain its second pair of legs and suddenly it was rediscovered it charted in the u.s because of that soundtrack and then you started seeing it in other movies and tv shows and the song gained a new pair of legs uh, but to me, it feels like I've always, always known about it. And it's just got such a timeless quality to it. And it's such a beautiful song. Oh, and, yeah. You know, and I can't, I can't really add too much to what you just said, TJ. Mm -hmm. Again, beautiful song. And it does kind of feel like it's always been here. And it, it just makes you feel 
I mean, kind of like the lyrics, you know, it makes you feel pretty good when you listen to that song. It's, it's, it's so life affirming. It's almost heartbreaking to listen to mm -hmm. at times. Yeah. If it, yeah. It's a, just amazing. Okay. Yeah. So that's my, that's my 51. What is your 52? Now my 52, I'm actually, I'm going to repeat a group here. They, they uh -huh. appeared earlier in my list and don't ask me which number, because like I told you earlier, yeah. I failed mm -hmm. math. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going with subdivisions from the band Rush. Um, wow. And uh, it, it, subdivisions is the second single from Rush's 1982 album Signals. And, you know, it marked a really uh, different and dramatic direction for the band. On subdivisions, this is like the first time that the band really had keyboards as kind of like the, the primary voice in the song, at least in, to my ear. And uh -huh. um, uh, but, you know, again, the band, uh, the keyboards are kind of like the lead instrument, and maybe the guitar and the drums are more rhythmic, but it's, there's just a really great quality to the song, what it says lyrically, um, you know, about kind of being independent, maybe not trying to, to go with everyone else and stuff. I mean, to me, the song is just very relevant, and here it is almost 40 years later, and it sounds just, you know, I just love that song. Wow. I am trying to remember this song if I've heard it or not before, but I'm not 100% sure. I may have heard it, but just can't place it by its title. Well, I'll tell you, after bank. we get done shooting, it starts with that really heavy kind of repeating keyboard line. Bah, 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 oh, bah. You know? yeah, yeah, I know. I know now. And, and it's you. like something you wouldn't have, wouldn't perhaps expected of Rush up until yeah. that time, even though they had utilized synthesizers and keyboards. But, you know, it became a... a you know, a really upfront instrument with the band on this song, you wow. know? Yeah. I do remember it now. Thank you for drawing yeah. my memory there. I just had to, I just had to hear you, uh, yeah. re, uh, repeat yeah, I'm that. Sure I'm not in the right key. If you're asking, that's okay. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Don't worry about it. So, um, now what's, uh, my, your, now what's your 52, my 52, here we go. My 52. Now it's funny. We talked about historical significance and how it's not important to this list. This song is considered historically significant within the history of rock and pop music, but I didn't pick it for that reason, okay? Uh, my number 52 is Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley and the Comets. It's very, thank you, it's very easy uh, to fall towards historical significance when talking about this song because many music historians will say, this is the song that brought rock and roll to the mainstream. It wasn't the first rock and roll song, but it was the one that made it, brought it into the public consciousness, you know, that this is rock and roll. This is a new genre of music. Um, but for me, if you forget about all that, it's just a damn fun song. You know, it's just, it's just really fun. It is impossible for me to hear that song and not immediately feel better, not immediately have a smile on my face, not immediately want to swing to it and move to it. You know, it's just a fun song. And I love that guitar solo. Oh yeah. That is a killer, killer guitar solo. I used to cover that song in a band of mine where we would do rock around the clock, we'd go into the solo and then we'd start to, with using the same, almost the same rhythmic structure of Rock Around the Clock, the other guitar player in the band would sing the uh, lyrics to uh, Rock and Roll by Led Zeppelin to it. Been a long time since I rocked and rolled, yeah. And he would just sing it to that, almost the same. We, we, we had to modify the rhythm just slightly, uh -huh. you know, to suit it. And then we'd come back into Rock Around the Clock. And because uh, we thought those were two songs about rock and roll and uh, one, one right there at the dawn of rock and roll, one there during the 70s when rock was reaching this amazing peak, right. you know, uh, as far as just artistry. And yet here was this just this uh, just rollicking, rousing you know, rock and roll song by Led Zeppelin. And we used to cover that. And it was I should um, I wish we'd recorded it. We never did, yeah. though. But yeah, uh, but yeah, rock good. around the clock, just way too much fun. Yeah. Oh, and it's what can you say? I I agree with you. It's it's if if we kind of think as Chuck Berry is kind of like maybe the biggest proponent of that era, 
never you got to give bill haley in the comments so much credit i mean that song it had to have had just an amazing impact on the world when when people heard it i mean i would love to go back in time and listen to it with those kind of um you know virgin ears you know having not been familiar with rock and roll it must have been so exciting and revolutionary i remember reading that that song actually caused an audience to riot in germany wow that it actually made young kids just start to kind of lose their minds. Wow. They went so crazy during it. It's, it's, it's insane to think about that. It is. Um, yeah, I have a collection of Bill Haley uh, uh, hits um, uh, that I've always uh, gone to. They were very much uh, a jazz influenced band. There's always was a strong jazz influence. And they had a lot of other really good songs beyond Rock Around the Clock that just don't get noticed anymore. Uh, they were always trying to regain the success of that song, but they never could. But yeah, there was more to them than that one hit single. They did release a lot of other really good records. And when I say records, I mean singles. Yeah, uh -huh. It wasn't an album world back then. But I do have a collection of Bill Haley hits uh, that uh, I recommend if you get a chance to just dig deeper and uh, check out some of their other songs. But yeah, there's, my, there's my 52. What's your 53? My 53, I'm going to cheat here if it's okay. Okay. Maybe I'll, so, and I'll try to support my reason for cheating. I'm going with the uh, first time uh, the cars are appearing on my list. Uh -huh. Okay. And I had to go with the band's first album. This album was so impactful to me when I was in high school, and I had never heard anything like the cars. I uh -huh. know we talked earlier about Rush with the keyboards. Well, here the cars were definitely a guitar band, but keep you know synthesizers were a big part of it but just the whole sound and the approach of the band to me was very different from what you were hearing on the radio and uh -huh. kind of a, a definite predecessor of what we would hear plenty of in the 1980s um but i'm going with moving in stereo and then oh. segues to the last track on the album which is all mixed up oh, and, okay you know to me when i was a when i was young and got that and i, I think i had it on cassette the way that those two great tracks went one into the other i could never listen to just one i had to listen <laughs> i had to listen to moving in stereo and all mixed up you know and um and, and you know moving in stereo is is really experimental kind of a little different you know where it's all mixed up is kind of more upbeat and you know it has that really great great sax playing from greg hawks who's the keyboardist in the band but he got to step out and play saxophone and played some great sax on All Mixed Up. But I just love the one-two punch, and it just brings back such great memories of discovering, you know, the Cars album. I mean, just what I needed was a big radio single that mm -hmm. I introduced the world. But yeah. once you got the album, I think every it's just a great album from start to finish. And I understand what you're saying about cheating, because I think I had to cheat, too, when we first did our first episode, because I'm pretty sure one of my, because one of my top picks was Funeral for a Friend slash Love Lies Bleeding by oh, Elton John, yeah. you know, yeah, which is two songs, album. technically speaking, but right. they lead right into each other. And we, they, it's impossible to divorce it, them from it's each other. It's kind of like, it's like, and I know we're not talking about it today, but kind of like Queen, uh, We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions. You know, yeah. those were two separate tracks, but the radio, I guess, per, DJs heard them together. And that's just what, yeah. now we, we think of it as one piece. Yeah, yeah, there are two tracks, but yeah, you just they lead right into each other when you hear them on the on on the record. I mean, there is a, maybe a brief gap of silence mm -hmm. from the last, you know, dun, from the last note of that guitar line before yeah. you hear Freddie Mercury say, "I paid, you know, I paid my dues," you know, and all that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 impossible to divorce those from each other. So yeah, you're not cheating, dude. That's just okay. that's well, just part of. Like I said, I'm not a good good student, well, at least when it comes to math. But you know, I'll try to get away with what I can here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great pick. I always really. It, you said it was called moving in stereo. I, for some reason, I thought it was called living in stereo. No, moving in stereo. Okay. Okay. Um, that's memory. That's just old age. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always liked those tracks too. I've always really liked those tracks too, and I haven't brought the cars into this list yet. Now that you've mentioned it, a car song has popped into my head now, but I'm going to save it for a future list. I, lo I look forward to hearing what your yeah. favorite yeah. cars track is. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about okay. it. So, so my number 53, also, I should say, it, and it is from the 80s, Everybody Wants to Rule the World 
by Tears for Fears from the album Song from the Big Chair. And there is something just incredibly hypnotic about the interplay between the pulsing bass line and the ethereal keyboard line. Because you got that bass line, boom, 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 you know, just really pounding. But then you've got that da da, just that very, just kind of it, it, it never quite resolves da da on the keyboards, and it's it's the bass is is driving, but the keyboard is just floating, very dreamlike, and that shouldn't work, but it does that interplay. And uh, uh, the song itself, for me, has always been very life affirming, just listening to it. It's always been this very life affirming experience to hear it. Yet, Kurt Smith, the song's lead singer, said that the themes about the song lyrically are quite serious. It's about everybody wanting power, mm -hmm. about warf warfare and the misery that it causes. Um, and to me, to read about this is kind of like dis disarming because that's not what I feel when I hear it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, the lyrics oftentimes, it seems, the lyrics sometimes contradict. Some, there's, the opening lines are about, welcome to your life, you know? It sounds like, you know, um, like a father greeting his newborn child. But there's all kinds of contradictory things being said when I listen to it. To me, there's so many ways that I can interpret that song. But when I just hear it as a whole, it's this very life-affirming and dreamlike experience. To me, listening to Everybody Wants to Rule the World is the closest I can feel like I'm in a dream when I'm wide awake, is how I'll describe it. Wow. Great. You know, all I had is a great song. And I'm a big Tears for Fears fan. I've seen them a number of times. They're just terrific. But yeah, great. And that's a great album that it's off of too. Yeah. Yeah. And one other thing, I really want to point out the guitar solo in that one. Uh, uh, hopefully I say his name right. Roland or Zabi or Zabe. Orzable. Orzable. Thank you. Orzable. Sorry. Um, but I don't think he gets enough credit for his amazing guitar work. Uh, especially on that song, the guitar solos, just the, once again, very dreamlike, ethereal guitar solos. He embraces absolutely no guitar cliches mm -hmm. in that song. And it, I think that's, it's, it's, it's kind of, to me, an underrated presence in that song. And he doesn't get enough credit because it doesn't sound like a guitar solo. And there's two in there. There's one that's more traditional where he's playing single notes, but there's another part where he's doing a lot of double note picking, plucking, and it almost feels like birds' wings flapping. That da 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 da. -da you know, I, if, if I, it's hard to actually hum that part, but it always reminded me of the sound of birds' wings mm -hmm. flapping, the way it sounds. And he doesn't get enough credit for his innovative guitar work. That second part that I just mentioned is to me very reminiscent of the edge in some ways but still uniquely his own yeah. and i just wanted to point that out there that when next time you listen to that song pay close attention to his guitar solo okay uh, he he just doesn't get enough credit um, yeah but that's my 53 yeah no that's a great 53 and i'm i'm going to go back and re-listen to that song with some of the things that you mentioned and i'm, I'm looking forward to it because with so many of these songs and these are all great songs we're discussing mm -hmm. There are so many levels to it and so many nuances, you know. Yeah. So my 50 track 54 is actually uh, uh, we're getting into the 90s now. So it's a little bit more recent and mm -hmm. it's always the last to know from Delamitri. And I know I've I recently talked to, about yeah. Delamitri to you, TJ. So this is my favorite song from the band. They have so many great, great songs uh, and they're probably better known for their 1995 single roll to me and that one matter of fact i was in the supermarket the other day and i heard it playing which was kind of funny but my favorite has always been always the last to know and that's on the band's third album change everything and what i'll say about delamitri is just you know there's always undercurrents of kind of uh a band being reflective thinking about the universe but boy the songs are just melodic have great 
harmonies, great choruses. And I just, it's one of these songs that always pops in my head. So I had to get it on the list. Excellent. I don't think I'm familiar with this song. I may be, I may not be, but um, definitely when we're done, I'll go check it out and okay. see if I've heard it before, but it's it a 90s was, tune, right? It was a, yeah, it was a 90s. It was a bigger hit in the UK and it did reach the top 40 uh -huh. here in the United States, but I've always thought it was so criminal that it wasn't like a number one hit. But again, that's me. But so at least I can bring it to our, our party today and talk about yeah. it. Very good. My 54 is going to be probably very obscure to a lot of people. I don't think you've heard it. I don't think a lot of people here have heard it. Uh, but it's a song called Million Dollar Bill by a group called Middle Brother from their only album they ever released, which was, which was self-titled. How shall I describe them? They are a band consisting of three singer-songwriters, John McCulley of Deer Tick, Taylor Goldsmith of Dawes, whom I know you're familiar with. Right, very familiar with, yeah. And Matt Vasquez of Delta Spirit. And you might call them an indie CSN, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You've got these three uh, singer-songwriters teaming up to kind of do like a little indie supergroup, so to speak. But they only produced this one self-titled album, nothing after that. And it's a really good album. And I think I may have even brought it to the Music Worth Buying show back in, the, back in the early days of that show. And actually, I take it back. This album didn't come back in the 90s. It came out in the 2000s during the okay. 21st century. Actually, I take it back. I was incorrect about that. Yeah, it came out during the, uh, during, sometime during the mid-2000s. And we were doing the Music Worth Buying show. And um, the song, Million Dollar Bill, is I'm just going to say it's one of the best heartbreak songs I've ever heard in my life. It's got, and I just to give you an idea of some of the lyrics here, the opening line is, when it hits me that she's gone, I think I'll run for president and get my face put on the million dollar bill. So when these rich men that she wants show her ways they can take care of her, I'll have found a way to be there with her still. Because wow. my face will be on the million dollar bill. And each member of the band sings their, that's the uh, like the part of the first verse, you know. Each one sings lead on a different verse where they sing a similar story. And when it hits me that she's gone, I think I'll do this so that I'll still be with her in some very tenuously removed way. Uh -huh. And it's just so filled with heartbreak and oh man and it's like i've said before only in music is heartbreak and sadness a wonderful thing to experience yeah you know you're just like oh you know i think it, i think it's just cathartic and i i'm sure you haven't heard this song i doubt oh, that many I people watching this show have heard this song the that release was not any kind of a big charting release the album itself it was just something that i stumbled across and mm -hmm. found and said wow i like this album i really like this album but this but this um this song just just knocked it out of the park you yeah. know and just one of those lost songs that should have been bigger but wasn't in yeah. another universe this song was a major hit yeah and one of the best heartbreak songs ever written so that's my that's my 54. And you don't have to comment because yeah. I'm sure you're not familiar with it. No, I'm not. I'm just going to say I, I definitely want to hear it, though. That's, OK, go look it up. Comment. And uh, so go ahead now. What is what is your next one? Well, my my next one um, is and I don't think I've done one yet. It's it's uh, a queen cut, mm -hmm. the hammer to fall. But specifically, I'm talking about the recording of the live version from Live Aid. Uh, oh. There's obviously a studio version of it. Yeah. The studio version is a little bit slower and just has a different feel. But I think the, you know, obviously when, when Queen played at Wembley Stadium in 1985, um, you know, there was so much energy yeah, I know. and power in the performance. But their version of that song 
is just incredible. I mean, it starts out actually with that intro where he does a call and response with the audience, hey, oh, and all that stuff. Yeah. And then they get, and then he says something like hammer. He just says hammer to fall. And then Brian May comes in with that really, hard, you know, that riveting guitar. And just, it, it's just such a potent version that, you know, whether you're watching it on the screen via the performance or just listening to it, it's just an amazing version. And, and, Brian May just does a couple of killer guitar solos in it too, but I love that. And, um, and the song definitely is, you know, talk, talking about heavy themes like we are today, it's definitely about life and death. And I think that there's just a real, uh, you know, and, it, and it, that's a serious topic, obviously, but just the music itself just sweeps you away. It's just such a, just a kick-ass rock and roll song, you know, and um, so, and, it, and it's appropriate you know, to have a song from that, because I know Queen's 21 minute appearance that day. Uh, and I, and I'd heard it before. So I looked it up, they said um, that uh, it was voted the greatest live performance in the history of rock in a 2005 industry poll of more than 60 artists, journalists and music industry executives. And, and I know a lot of people have seen it because of the Bohemian Rhapsody movie, or they, like us, they saw it when it was originally aired. But um, I, I had to have something from that that concert set, and that's a good one to to choose. Yeah, I've read that Elton John uh, after after they after they got off stage, I've read that purportedly Elton John said to them, "Thanks a lot, guys. Nobody wants to follow you now." Yeah, you know, and yeah, and I remember seeing that in Live Aid back when it first was airing around the world, and yeah, that was just a stellar performance. Uh, one for the books, and yeah. I've always liked that song, "Hammer to Fall." Great song, yeah. And uh, and we both, you, are you, I think you, I think I know I brought up Queen because Bohemian yeah. Rhapsody was in my first five, yeah. But I'm pretty sure you brought up Queen previously. I'd have to go well, back and just, look. Yeah, but just under pressure, and and my problem is uh, just to share with the viewers. I don't know, we haven't talked about it for a while, but Queen was my first big band I was going to see live when I was. I saw them four times with Freddie Mercury. I would see them once a tour, you mm -hmm. know, when they, uh, in high school and college. Wow. And um, I was a huge fan, but it's hard for me to almost select a, a single song, you yeah. know? I mean, Under Pressure is just, you know, Bowie and Queen. It's just in a, probably yeah. the greatest to me collaboration between two different artists. I mean, like Paul McCartney's collaborations have not been that great or, you know, Michael Jackson's, I mean, that was a killer collaboration. But Queen on their own is just what what a great body of work that they created. You know, so many great songs. Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. We could go on and on about them, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. So this brings me to my 55. For my 55, I have mentioned this band before. And uh, the song is going to be Bad by U2 from the album The Unforgettable Fire. And at just over six minutes, Bad, to me anyways, you can argue this point, anybody can argue this point, but for me, Bad is U2's Stairway to Heaven. Mm -hmm. It's their epic. And just like Stairway to Heaven, Bad takes me on this epic six-minute musical journey through the mind, which is what happens when I listen to Stairway to Heaven. Same thing happens with Bad. And the amazing thing about the song is that it's built around two chords. Some will argue four chords mm -hmm. because it's just A, A sus four, D, D sus two. And most guitarists don't really think they're playing four chords. They say they're playing two chords. They're just adding the pinky finger, yeah. <laughs> you know? And we're just doing a, vari a little variation, a little to us, that's not another chord. That's just a little lick on the same chord. Uh -huh. Technically speaking, it's four chords, but to yeah. us guitarists, it's to most guitarists that I talk to, it's just two chords. Right. <laughs> You're getting technical when you say sus two and sus right. and you sus are. four. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's that song doesn't get old to me. It's just this journey. I think it's up to individual interpretation, even though the band has in interviews talk that it's mostly about heroin addiction in Dublin but the lyrics are so vague and that I think you can kind of put your own interpretation to it depending on where you are I think a lot of great U2 songs are that way uh the, a song that I know I brought up 
of running to stand still, mm -hmm. you know, to me, those lyrics were so beautiful. And for a long time, I had no clue what they were about. I just, my own brain put my own thoughts into what that song was about. When I finally found out was what it was about, I was disappointed, you know, and I said, oh, forget that, you know, um, it's, 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 you know, I'd rather go with what my brain thinks it's about. To me, it's much better that way. So, yeah. Yeah, and I don't think they would mind that one bit. No. Um, but yeah, um, uh, that song can be about whatever you want it to be, in my no. opinion. But that's my number 55. Yeah, great song. And kind of like what I was just saying, Queen, you two have so many great songs. It's But that that is a terrific song. Yeah. Glad you, glad you approve. Yeah. So yeah. that is our 51 through 55. So when we get together next time, it's going to be uh, 56 through 60. As we work our way, we're going to get back to doing this again. Yeah. And just like in the previous uh, episodes of this show, which, by the way, uh, I've created a playlist of all the episodes in case you are new, haven't seen the previous episodes, or you just want to brush up on the old ones. But just like in all those episodes, we invite you to please now tell us your 51 through 55 and some of the most fun about doing this videos was just reading everybody's responses of their five exactly in the comments and you said something really nice several episodes back on this series where you said your list is just as valid as ours exactly and you're 100 percent correct everybody watching your list is just as valid as ours these are personal lists these are not based on historical significance this is just how the songs affect you personally yeah and, and so and please and just to reiterate what you said at the beginning being a longtime music critic a lot of people just proclaim these are the best songs and i said you know i'm not going to go there i and we, when we set out to do this we said these are our personal favorite songs like you're saying you know it something could be a you know be a silly little ditty but if it if it connects with you personally then then it should be on the list yeah exactly don't yeah and just like i said whatever whatever pops in your head as you're going down the numbers that's it that's it right there because it wouldn't have popped in your head if it wasn't exactly yeah yeah and and be damned if no matter what it doesn't matter if it's not cool or you don't think it's not cool or all the publications out there say it's not cool or the youtubers <laughs> out there say it's not cool all the influencers say it's not cool doesn't matter you picked it stand by it be proud of it and uh, yeah, no matter what it is. And anyways, though, so cool. This was, it's so good to get back and do this. It is. And to be able to, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, there's already some ideas buzzing in my head. And hearing you talk about the cars has already put a song on the list. Oh, good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, That's yeah. Good. So we'll do this again. Everybody, if you want to see more videos like this, please click like, click subscribe smash the bell notification icon and I uh, want to thank the patron supporters who help us make videos too. If you'd like to be a patron supporter, go to patreon.com slash TJR, the original uh, pledge, whatever you can. And also want to thank everybody who shares these on their social media. And until next time, I'm TJR. And I'm Robert Kinsler. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.